Hey, how's it going? I'm your pal, Mike Squires, and this is the Couchress Podcast, episode number 227. And my guest this episode is Spencer Moody, the lead singer from Murder City Devils, uh, but most recently has put out a record uh, with friends under the name M. Krebs. I've been listening to this record. I've been enjoying it a lot. Um, this has this sort of... Uh, post-wave gothic Americana. I don't know. It's cool, though. I think that you'll like it. Uh, we get into sort of the process a little bit, how they made this record and sort of the thematics of the, the songs. Um, and we take a couple of twists and turns. We talk some coffee. We talk about what Spencer is doing now, occupationally. Uh, and, you know... The thing is, you are a musician with no technical professional training other than your your craft, and you end up doing some pretty interesting things in your life. And he's doing some, I think, pretty interesting shit right now, um, living in Hawaii. So, and uh, I hope that you enjoy this conversation. I really, really enjoyed talking with him. There was a, a split. We had some sort of a technical glitch in the middle so there is a there's a part where you know the conversation takes a it just stops and then picks up so it feels a little jagged uh but just hang in there with us um i hope you enjoy if you are enjoying the couchless podcast please support us on patreon patreon.com slash couch riffs your support is what makes this podcast happen um absolutely without a doubt so i thank everyone who is already supporting i thank you in advance if you are considering or you're about to support um again it takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of me um, because i use a lot of services that cost money i send packages out to every artist who appears in a music video I pay, I pay people. I can't pay the artists because we, we simply don't. The Patreon is not big enough. If the Patreon was huge, I would pay everyone to be involved. And furthermore, if I could pay people, you would see more people jumping on board to do this. And you would see probably more famous artists as well. And, you know, if when and if the Patreon ever grows to that point, I would love to just say, who would you like to see? Because I think if you, because nothing, as if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, nothing says thank you like money. And if, and if I go to someone and say, Hey, I'd like to pay you to appear in a Couchless video, they would be more likely to get it done. Some of these videos take a long time. Starship Trooper took well over a year, but there are other videos that are taking a long time. I've been working on this fucking summertime by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince for over a year. It was supposed to come out last summer, but it, these things just take time. These things take a lot of time. So if you, hey, hey, if you have a rapper that you can recommend for that track in particular, that's all I need. I just need someone to fucking rap. I've, I've, I've shouted it out on instagram a few times and so far no luck so send me your recommendations all right i would like to thank a couple people really quickly i want to thank um river city guitars in spokane washington river city guitars is a small boutique by appointment only um you know vintage used guitar store so they've got a sick load of vintage hammers right now. Go check out their reverb store. It's ridiculous. And they, they just like, they sold three of them like that. Just like for in 24 hours, less than 48 hours. I think these things are rare, rare, rare. And so killer. They're like standards and sunbursts. Those are, they're like my dream guitars. Um, please do follow, follow them on social, follow them at reverb. 
they have uh, so many cool guitars that are about to go up on their reverb store and if you follow them you're going to get notified of of what they're posting and it's super cool also if you have uh, some cool vintage used guitar that you are looking to sell or an amp, some effects, drums, whatever it might be. Get a hold of them. Sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. Tell them I sent you. They're like family to me. I sold my hummingbird through them. I've got my vintage uh, Hamer Steve Stevens there through them. And a couple other guitars that I have. Strat. Um, so... Thank you very much, River City Guitars. You guys are fucking aces. Also, thank you very much to Variety Coffee Roasters in Brooklyn, New York. Variety Coffee Roasters is what I drink every single morning. Every morning. I don't know what greater endorsement I can give something than just to use it and tell you about it. It's delicious. Uh, Roasted there in Brooklyn. They have... Uh, six or seven cafes throughout Brooklyn and the city. Go check out their cafes. They're awesome. If you're visiting the city, it's not to be missed. Very, 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 very New York. Um, more importantly, do you know how I can drink this coffee every single morning? Because I have it every day. Do you know how I have it every day? Subscription. I've got a subscription. Go over to their website, Variety Coffee Roasters. Tippy tappy in there. Uh, click a couple buttons, a- answer a couple questions, and they'll send you coffee every week, every two weeks, every month, whatever you want, however much or however little you want. Uh, you can't go wrong. It's just that simple. So thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters. You guys are fucking aces. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you do for my day, too. Um, we're going to get into the episode. I'm sorry, I rambled a little bit longer than, than normal this uh, this time because I was yammering about summertime. It's summertime now, man. I'm sweating in the studio. I just turned the AC on five minutes before, so it's uh, it's here. Summer is here. Don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's not that hard to just not be a dick. It was made like at one of those places where you can paint your own. Like where um, you can cast it's your a, own. um, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a Kevin Willis mug. Very um, nice. It's a, it's a, um, it has, it's nice and big at the top. I, I hate my co- coffee, uh, too hot. Yeah. And so it's a good mug because it allows it to, um, cool fairly quickly. And it holds a fair amount also, but it's heavy. Do you, do you have some coffee snobbery carryover? I know that mm, you, you were not anymore. At Stumptown. Yeah, I was, uh, um, I went hard, fast and deep into, um, coffee snobbery. And, um, as soon as like literally the moment I stopped working in that field, it completely lifted and I, I don't give a fuck. And um, one thing that's great about where I live is at the grocery store, I can get this um, decent and extremely inexpensive coffee. And I just um, put in way more, I buy it ground. I I, um, just use way more than you're supposed to. And um, (laughs) it's completely awesome. And and also living in Los Angeles, it was like basically... um, my the, my boss is like some sometimes some taqueria coffee was was too 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 bad i i couldn't with that was my, that was my bottom right. and then uh but like now i i drink um essentially like um that sort of middle grade like truck stop coffee almost every day and i'm completely happy with it well, that's got to be full circle. You probably drank your share of truck stop coffee on tour. Yeah, I learned to drink coffee. The first, co- I wasn't a coffee drinker until I was probably in my like early twenties, and it was definitely touring. And it was the what got me into coffee. Really, was the uh, out of the uh, the dispen the the machine that drops the paper right. cup, you know, and then pours right, the. Sure. And I would get like the mocha. Um, that was my gateway. The mocha. <laughs> Oh, Mocha. 
<laughs> we love you. Yeah. Um, you, so you're in Hawaii, is that right? It's true. I try How? to um downplay it because um I feel strongly about not um like promoting it as a place to move to. But um, right. yeah, I, I live on the Big Island. How did you how did you end up there? Uh, my wife grew up here, and um, we had sort of we honeymooned here, and we had sort of kind of since the day we met, we always talked about moving different places or whatever. And um, then uh, she went on a, on a trip here with a friend, and um, she called me on the phone when they were leaving and said, um, "You know, I just I love it here so much, and I." And I hate leaving here. And um, like, basically, she was like, I feel like I'm leaving part of myself whenever I leave. And uh, do you want to move here or whatever? And um, so then we just started figuring out how to make that happen. And um, because things had gotten so expensive where we were living, um, and this is like, this is like, this conversation was probably started like um, maybe about four years ago or something. And, um, so it was actually like, it was a, it was a reasonable transition financially or whatever at that time for the part of the Island right. where we, we are, um, uh, it, we were able to make it work because my kind of figured, like I kind of just work low wage jobs anyways. And, um, if the monthly expenses were going to be the same, then we could swing it or whatever, you know, right. and, um, same, same. It, ended up being like a totally good yeah you're like you out in the sticks like upstate new york yeah we're in the hudson valley it's cool and i love it yeah man it's you know we were my wife and i were just sitting in the yard around the fire you know the fire pit that we built not yeah. without a fire it's it's still like it's pretty you know it's light out so we were just talking about how much we love it how yeah. stoked we are yeah yeah, we ate at a place that was next to a highway today, like with you know benches and it's you know beautiful. There's a lot of traffic, and we you know we were both remarking, like how crazy it is that we could sit here and eat, and all that traffic doesn't bother us at all. Probably because we are desensitized from eating on sidewalks in Brooklyn and just like breathing exhaust <laughs> and you know just ter it's just terrible yeah it's really funny here because people always complain about um like the like dr the distance between places and um like commute like their commute and stuff like that and it's like <laughs> i lived in los angeles you know right. it's like if you get in your car it's gonna take you an hour what you could it takes you an hour to do anything you know and here it's like i drive the most beautiful road i've ever seen in my life for you know 45 minutes and people are like oh man how do you do that every day it's, it's, it's all right You're like with the windows down yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> uh, you lived in new york also is that right i lived in um brooklyn for a year and a half um and that was like uh i'm really bad knowing what year something happened or how long ago, but, um, uh, it must've been probably, uh, close to 20 years ago, I guess now, uh, like, right. let's just say, like, let's we'll say it was like 16 years ago. I lived in um, Burham Hill. Um, and, uh, it was the Smith and Bergen stop on the, train uh and i oh, yeah. i mean i love i love new york i love new york so much I, yeah but it yeah, was not, not a, so bad it was a hard time for me though in my life was it uh during or or after the the first break of the devils it was but it was right after that it was when um it was like uh the bay i think i was in the band I was in that toured, I was in, I was doing Triumph of Lethargy with my friend Corey. And then I think 
maybe um maybe smoke and smoke was also doing stuff it was when murder city devils were officially broken up which was about a, i think about a um maybe about a five year period and then once we reformed it wasn't very long till that just seemed like it was really we we it, it was foolish of us for us to at like act to say we had ever broken up because it's we just right kind of came back together or whatever but um uh yeah it was after it was right after murder city doubles so all right let's uh let's back up and and start the line of questioning okay where are you from kirkland washington oh is that right yeah yeah You're like the rare native northwesterner yeah me and mark arm are both from kirkland the two guys that made it out yeah. <laughs> at you and Costco. Yeah. Yeah. You guys in Costco. Yeah. You... Yeah. Whenever I see the Kirkland brand, I'm reminded of, of home. Right. Uh, was music a thing that was always happening as a kid? Um, I didn't come from a family that had any interest whatsoever, really in music, but um, I always, did you know i was always uh like um i mean me and my wife were just talking last night about how crazy it is that um so many people in the world are like seem to be totally unmoved like by music and not like it's not part of their lives really but for me uh Really, it always, it always was just in whatever I could access, you know, I mean, I was like one of those kids that was like, um, you know, someone, uh, a kid I knew because our parents were friends. Um, we were on like the, you know, back of a car together when I was like, probably maybe 11 or or so and he played me um dead kennedy's on his like walkman you know like put the headphones on my head and i was just like what like it was it was so insane like i couldn't relate to it i could relate to it totally but i couldn't put it in any time or place because the name the name of the band was confusing to me because sure. it was like i mean the the kennedys are like this holy these holy people right you know and it's like so the irreverence of the name was very impressive to me and then musically i i couldn't i was like is this old music like i remember asking like i'm like is this old yeah. um and he was like, nah, I don't not I don't think so, you know, and um, and it totally blew my it totally it was like totally set me on this new trajectory. And then I went to the Fred Meyer music market <laughs> to um, to look to see if I could find dead Kennedys. And I um, they didn't have dead Kennedys, but they did have um, the dead milkman. So I got a Dead Milkman cassette because I could tell, I, I felt like confident that this is the same zone, which is That's sort right. of true. And which then, one um, was it? Which uh, album? Eat Your Paisley. Yeah. And um, I listened to the shit out of it. I mean, I listened to it. I mean, I listened to it fucking thousands of times. I mean, You were 11? I was 11. I can, I can put it in front. I, I was 11 or 12. When I was 13, we moved. So that's like... The year, so I, I have some, um, but when I was 13, I was listening to a lot of, um, I was listening to Appetite for Destruction and Born to Run, mostly. Oh. Um, and then there was like, I had a friend who was into the Misfits, so I borrowed, I borrowed his Misfits cassette a little bit, and then... Um, at some point when I was like 13 or so, um, I got a record player and then I started buying like seven inches and stuff. And then when I was like, um, 
maybe 15. When I was like a freshman in high school is when I started actually going to like shows and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think but also the other thing is I got the um, uh, Thrasher magazine. I had a subscription to Thrasher and they had this skate rock comps. Yeah. So I had one of those and it was bad. It was not good, but I listened right. to that a lot. Before your exposure to the Dead Kennedys in the back of that car, w- did you have just like a surface relationship with music? Or um, were you no, I had to a whatever good, was on the radio? I had, like I loved music. I loved Pat Benatar. I loved um, KSW. Yeah, totally. I loved KSW. Um, the first stuff I heard was the first radio was we just I had an AM radio. Um, in my bedroom that my parents got me to um, help me sleep. And um, it was like, that was KJR, I think. Um, it was like Islands in the Stream and stuff like that. Um, then K- and, what, was it, what was that one? Uh, K-Jet? Did that come along? Um, it was called like well, K- there was Kixie. That was Z-Rock? the um, best songs from the post-war era, which is what my <laughs> um, grandparents listened to. Sure. And that never really, I wasn't really into that. Yeah, there was, I don't know, Jet, K-Jet, I don't know, probably. Um, there was, I feel like there was a, like a college rock AM station. Oh, oh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I did listen to the... Um, Whatever BK was, is KUOW the, what's the, whatever the call, what would the Green University River. of Washington station? KCMU. KCMU, when it was like actually at the University of Washington. Yeah. Um, that had some sometimes stuff. Oh, and you know, and actually what was huge also is when the end, 107.7 first started like the first like year of their existence that was like really huge um because they actually played they played some pretty they would still play like blondie songs and stuff like that even though that was right. not the same time period or whatever and then um uh they would you know bring they would play some local kinds of stuff which KSW would play some local stuff too sometimes or like yeah. maybe late at night or something. But I would always listen to like, I was huge, like, um, like, you know, REM on MTV unplug was like big deal. I recorded that. Yeah. They, they played that on the radio also. And I um, dubbed it onto a cassette. Listen to that a right. lot. Um, that was a pretty, that was a strong move as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> you'd have to if you wanted a song. Sometimes you'd have to like hang oh, out by the radio, and then yeah, then you were yeah. tied to that version. Like if you didn't have good reception, yeah, totally. Your recording would reflected that. It was yeah. You'd have to hear the intro of the DJ. All yeah, that bullshit. Yeah, totally. Do you remember as a kid? Was there like a line in the sand? amongst the the ranks of, of other kids there, your peers where uh, you had to make a strong choice. Were you going to have a rock shirt or a KZOK shirt? Um, well, it's like, I, it, it's like the t-shirt situation was more like there were the kids with like metal, like Slayer, Metallica, um, there, I do remember sometimes some really great homemade t-shirts. Like, um, there was this kid in my neighborhood that had this, like, oversized white t-shirt that he had written in, like, marker, um, Bon Jovi rocks your ass off, which is, like, pretty uh, <laughs> awesome. Um but, uh, but I wasn't really into, I, it was like, I appreciated metal. Because I had friends that were in the metal and I could listen to it. Um, and like there were maybe like the first couple um, Metallica records. But things yeah. like like the t-shirt bands like Slayer, Metallica, and then like on the other end, like the Smiths or Bauhaus or something like that. I felt like um, 
these were two. You can't be a fucking poser, you know. And I wasn't deep enough into this shit to really like go with those things. Like I felt like, um, like you, in order to wear one of those shirts, you had to like join the cult or whatever. That I wasn't quite right. ready to to join. So my rock t-shirt situation didn't really happen until I started going to like punk shows, and then I'd buy like buy t-shirts. Um, when I was a teenager, your, I had a your first really show? awesome um, Millions of Dead Cops t-shirt. There was the um, uh, Ronald McDonald like skanking with like blood dripping off of him, and it, yeah. the corp- corporate death burger. That was a nice. fucking tight shirt, but I was older then at that point. Um, but uh, you know, I had like a. Um, uh, I went. To, I saw David Bowie on the Sound and Vision tour. I think when I was like thirteen, and so that was. Oh, a, I had that T-shirt. Um, but also, it's my mom was people... really not into. Like, I wasn't even allowed to have like the Bones Ripper T-shirt. Because it was violent. too, yeah, it was like too much. I, I remember bringing my mom into the like skate shop and being like, I got to get this shirt. And she was just like, hell no, hell no. No child of mine is going to be seen in that, you know, just like so comical. It was really popular for a while for uh, men, young men, mostly to get tattoos of beasts ripping mm. out of their skin around that yeah. time yeah As sadly result, i don't i don't i know someone that had a i know someone that had the bones ripper at tattoo and got it covered up i got a cat in a hat ripping out of my skin oh and nice like, as a you know as a reaction i was like <laughs> this is like the most unmacho thing i could do even though i was still finding my way yeah uh, uh yeah no my tattoos are about 50 percent uh well no that's probably 20 percent um could be humiliating if you allowed them (laughs) you allowed your mind to go down that path sure (laughs) well uh do you remember your first show like non-parents like not concert Um, style show well the the David Bowie concert was a big deal for me, but that was like, you know, stadium or whatever. My older sister took me and a friend. Um, and then as far as like, oh, there was a, um, I don't know what year it was, but there was a skateboard competition called the Gotcha Grind at the, um, not the arena, the, at, Seattle Center, the, what's it called? The, the, um, like shed sized venue, like the, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, it's the probably, outdoor thing? The, uh, no, it was indoor, but anyways, it was this, um, it was like big ramp skateboard competition and it was like Christian Hasoy and Steve Caballero and that like generation. Right. And, um, it was two nights. And the first night, um, Social Distortion played after the skateboarding. And um, it got shut down because people were moshing. And it was like early enough that that was like the venue was just like, fuck no. Like this too. It was too. It was still like a time when it was like um, uh, too confusing to the, you know, people running the venue or whatever. So that was probably my first introduction to being around um, like older teenagers that were um, like, like kind of scary, but kind of awesome, you know? Right. There's something about being exposed to things that are scary to you uh, that if you're the right kind of person, it's also really attractive, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it was finally like something, because I was scared of everything, you know? Sure. So finally I could be scared of something that was like appealing, scary, you know? <laughs> Instead of just like, 
school or a test or, you know, like um, something like that, you know? Right. At that point, had you decided that you wanted to, had, did you have a guitar or a bass or anything? Were you, were you thinking I, I want to do music? Yeah, I can't remember. I was got a guitar. I stopped. I'd been taking um, art classes. I'd been taking painting classes, um, which I really enjoyed and valued. I didn't show a particular aptitude for it, but um, and and then at some point, I asked my mom if I could stop doing that and take guitar lessons instead. And I think I was like, um, I don't know, I was like fourteen or fifteen. And, um, so at that point, as soon as I had a guitar, I was more interested in like writing songs than learning songs, but also that's partly because, um, I'm, um, can just really, really honestly say I'm just, uh, profoundly untalented at guitar playing. I'm just fucking bad at it. Like I'm, um, me t- you abnormally me bad at it. And, uh, <laughs> I've chosen to do it anyways, you know, like, and now I'm like 46 and, um, I love playing the guitar. You know, I play the guitar most days. I really got a lot of pleasure out of it. Um, I've, I've made some songs that I feel totally great about, but, um, I'm bad at it, but I, yeah, I was, uh, I was in bands as a singer um, as soon as I could, as soon as there were other kids started playing instruments and stuff. Um, and, uh, but I was bad at that also. I mean, I was fucking horrible at it. It was, um, (laughs) it wasn't until the first time that I think I showed that I might have some kind of aptitude as far as like just one little narrow niche that I could, um, maybe be worthwhile at was um, this band I was in called Area 51 that was just like a, like a um, hardcore band, like a um, uh, screaming, screaming and yelling um, (laughs) hardcore band uh, that um, I feel like uh, it kind of, it kind of holds up. I wouldn't be able to um, do it now because I, the songs are just all about like, you know, killing cops and stuff like that. I would feel weird about it, but, um, but, uh, it was a pretty fun, good band. I'd say. Uh, that was a, that was a Seattle band. Mm-hmm. It was with Dan Gallucci, who was in oh. Mercy Devils and Derek Fidesco yeah. from Mercy Devils and, um, Andrea Zolo, who's in Pretty Girls Make Graves and, uh, Deep Creep. And, um, and then we had a few different, uh, a few different drummers, um, one of them, the, 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 the sort of most skilled of which being um, Andy Sells, who's still in Seattle doing really cool stuff. And I play with him sometimes. So it's all people. So that was when I was like um, 18. And these are all people, every, everyone involved um, are people that I still do stuff with. Yeah. How long did that band go? And also mm, less than eight, probably you- maybe a year. Are you younger than Derek? Uh, we're the same age. I can't remember. We're very he close to the same moved age. To, he moved to Seattle at 18? Oh, yeah. He was young. He moved out. Of, I mean, he was one of those people that um, he, like, ran away when he was, like, you know, 14 or something. And then, like, when his mom, like, figured out that he could survive on his own, she was kind of like, you know, okay. Cool step. Yeah. I mean, he was like, a, um, he was old for his age at that time. Um, right. and, uh, um, we were looking, he was his girl. We knew his girlfriend at the time and she knew we were looking for a bass player. And, um, he, when I met him, it was at the, there was a, um, I think it was a Subway Sandwiches, but it might have been a, I think it was a Subway Sandwiches. It was on the same block as the Velvet Elvis. And, um, oh, sure. We went and sat down together 
and uh, is there a subway down there um, around the uh, around the uh, on the First Avenue side? It would have been. I think it was just between the alley and First Avenue. It might have turned <laughs> into a um, that a burrito place. Oh yeah, that burrito yeah, yeah. chain, or yeah. maybe it was the burrito chain. I'm not sure. But um, he was. Uh, I asked him like what kind of music he listened to or whatever, and he said, "I only listen to the Germs." I was like, "Cool, you'll be good. This will be good." <laughs> he moved into my old house on Capitol Hill. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's a, this is a good segue because um, Derek uh, was working downtown. Um, yeah, at had, the lusty he, lady. He had a he had a magical job there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, taking care of the janitorial services over there at the Lusty <laughs> Lady, the peep yeah. show for people who are, uh, yeah, are in the dark on this. And I worked yeah. at the Pike Place Market, and he was like, he he came and he was so excited. He was telling me about his new band, and um, and I saw, I mean, what I imagine must have been one of the first Devils shows. Oh yeah, at, it might have been the Hookers. Uh, no, it was definitely the Devils. Okay, it was Mercy yeah. the Devils. It was uh, at Sit and Spin, uh-huh. and there were maybe tw- I don't know twenty, twenty five people there. Yeah, yeah, we were killing um, it. It was fucking great, <laughs> and you know I think I went and bought the seven inch <laughs> when it came out. It must have been a about that time i mean that might have been the seven inch release party i don't even know. yeah it's probably maybe the one that was on empty records yeah um yeah probably Very what possible. do you remember about the early like of that period of time what's like when you think about that time what is the overwhelming i think feeling you have if if you have the first murder city devils record and you look at the cover, the album art on the cover, all I can say is that um, I wouldn't say that we didn't have a sense of humor about it, but um, we were serious. We took, we thought of, we were stoked on that album art. Like that's where we were. Like that's where our heads were. And um, uh, we really um, we really had a sense of mission. Like we were really doing it. We were really, um, and uh, it's so now thinking back at um, the absurdity of the way that we were, and. Um, it really, I just, I, I love it. I just, it's so funny to me. It's so awesome. Like it's so, we were very sincere about this thing that we were doing. Um, that was really, um, I mean, I don't know how it looked from like the other side of the stage or whatever, but, um, I mean, I know for a fact, like we weren't like, I, I, I guess it was, it might've been compelling or had, had some sort of thread of, um, of something going on or whatever. But, um, I mean, I know we weren't good at it. You know what I mean? We are just oh, doing it. I thought it was great. <laughs> that's, that's I awesome. really did. <laughs> um, hmm. So here, the other funny thing is, is for like a a year or a year and a half, um, I was in Harvey Danger, yeah, as like a hired guitar player. I don't yeah. know if you know that or not. No, I remember. But, I I do know that. That's like that's my um, like I I um no I I remember that. So yeah. there is there was that the funny thing I never had. I never had a dog in that fight. I don't know what the weird uh, thing was. I remember the stranger being uh, particularly excited about being involved in in that drama. 
but well, what it was was um, uh, there um, when I think maybe two Harvey Danger dudes worked at the newspaper the that at the University of Washington. Yeah. Um, and there was a review. I think that's where this was. It might've been in the stranger, but, um, early on there was a review of the murder city devils that referred to us as, um, Rollins esque blow a tree. Really? As, uh, um, not as a compliment, <laughs> I don't think. And, um, Sean Nelson wrote it and it was just like, boom is fucking on like, um, and, uh, our he was mad cause you didn't sound like Sebado. <laughs> <laughs> our shtick was that we were like tough guys or whatever, you know? Right. And you that was not their fight? shtick at all or no. whatever. <laughs> no. Um, they were sincere, artists you know or whatever and um and uh we were just like fuck these guys and um and um that's great and acted like crazy assholes you know just like uh, just acted uh, like fucking dicks and um to do whatever we could to um be intimidating or whatever and it's a small town, you know, and it wasn't that, and, and it was a, it was always a joke. I mean, we weren't like, it was funny. We, it was funny to us, but it was also, um, you know, not something that I'm proud of now, but it's funny is, it was funny. You know, it's funny. Like, and I, and, and, um, and now I can, you know, like, uh, I can appreciate Sean Nelson as an extremely intelligent, you know, sure person with um with a uh, vast you know knowledge of film and art and um and uh and he didn't know the difference between what you were doing and what rollins did though <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um and also, you know, I was, I mean, I, I had a chip on my shoulder. I, I, I'm sure I still do or whatever, but also I sort of had this thing with like, how are you going to make music? How are you going to be an artist and be an art critic? Um, sure. When it's like, you know, we're out there doing the same shit you do. You know, we have to get in our fucking, you know, we had to get in our van just like they had to get in their van. And we had to fucking drive to the first show was in Minneapolis or whatever the fuck, you know? Right. So, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I could, see but, I, but I, but I, but I don't mean that. But when I say that I'm not, I'd have no <laughs> grudge. It's right. just a funny, it's a funny I, thing from the past. I do remember, and I have I mean, no, I totally respect this guy. By the year 2000, it must've been, we were both on end fest. Yeah. And you, you came up on stage because. Yeah. Just to make a joke people, of it. Right. Cause. Uh, oh, people, and me and Sean look alike. Right. Except for he's way said, bigger than me. We, we, we don't like look alike at all. Four, right? Yeah. Yeah. In real life, we don't look <laughs> the same, but in like a picture, we look the same and people would mistake me for him like fairly often. Right. <laughs> Which was funny. Uh, so, in reference to sort of this the image that you guys are projecting at this at this early point in the band's life, did that reputation ever precede you to a place where it where you guys found yourself in trouble? No, not really. You not never really. showed up to a town and people would be like. You got, you got, you know. We showed up we, to We pissed town. on the hydrants around here. We showed up and um, we showed up maybe once or maybe twice. And there was a fire, fire marshal there to say, don't set your shit on fire. Um, Is your name David Yao? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it Get was after the. Uh, it was because of the. Um, I think it was White Snake thing in Providence. Great White. Great White. Great White. Yeah, that was that a club burned down. Tragedy. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of. It was a tragedy, and those fire marshals were right. They were correct. We were wrong, and they were right. And um, so there was that. We, I don't think we ever showed up, and there were people like waiting to kick our asses or anything. Uh, you we guys did, did have some fire um, people action. People broke though. our people uh, slashed our tires probably really? on three occasions. And really? people, yeah, and people um, broke the wind the windshield out of the van once. What towns were these? Um, the windshield was in uh, somewhere in like in Arizona, and the tire slashing once happened in San Jose, and then happened other places also, and. Um, Probably someone that Derek knew. <laughs> Some payback. <laughs> we, we, well, we, didn't, we didn't play Fresno. Um, uh, uh, but we didn't give up. We didn't care. We just didn't right. care. It was like, that was just like built in. It didn't make anyone angry. We just fixed it. You know, we just right. fixed it and just moved on. You know, it's like literally... That shouldn't, it didn't bother us. And all of my stupid, obnoxious, um, lame behavior and performances in front of audiences, no one in the band ever acted bummed out or criticized me or it was like, it was just the way that we rolled at that time. That's a sign of a of a of a band that sticks together. One thing you guys have you guys never had any members rotate out, right? I mean, oh it's... no, we have we have. Oh really? Um, Nate Manny's not in the band anymore, and um, uh, and Leslie doesn't play with us anymore, right? Um. But uh, me and Dan and Derek um, have been playing together since before this band, and Cody has been with us the whole time. What a vicious drummer. Good fucking yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, I also had, I had the privilege of, of doing a show. I don't know if we were coming or going to South by Southwest. Um, it was an odd pairing, indeed. It was at the Rubber Glove in uh, Denton. Is that Denton, mm. Texas, the Rubber Glove? Kind of a high stage. Uh, um, I just remember there was like a basketball court behind. You like walk off the stage and it's just like right behind. It uh, mm. must have been 2002 or three. Is it up a whole bunch of rickety stairs? Yeah, it's like a second dead low, floor. Dead low tide. Oh, okay. That um, okay. That would be okay. That then no, I do. Yeah, okay. Would that be two thousand two? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, two thousand three, maybe two thousand. Yeah, terrible. probably two thousand two. Two thousand one is when Mercy Devils broke up. So two thousand two would make sense. Right. Yeah. How do you recall that tour? Um, I remember. No, I remember. <laughs> I feel like. Um, there was a. You must have been headed to South by Southwest because there'd be no other know. reason to be in yeah. Texas uh, <laughs> at that that week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so you were you were essentially on your way to New York. So who are you with? Who are you with at the time? I was playing with Alien Crime Syndicate. We had oh, like Okay. We had yeah. like Kiss Okay, I do remember. And, I do remember. You know, 
yeah. strobes and lasers and shit. <laughs> we are like an arena rock band. Uh, if uh, Did you guys have a big song? We had a, like song, a radio song that in Seattle people thought was big. And, okay. you know, maybe in a few markets it got played. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, not enough that I, you know, I wasn't able to buy a new bicycle or anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that you said that that period was like a was pretty tough for you. Um, not from a, like, I mean, not from that standpoint, like, um, but yeah, I mean, well, I'm just like, a um, you know, naturally depressive person with a lot. It took me, I mean, I had a lot of conflict around, um, like internal conflict around like um like playing music and like what i don't know it's like i i was just you know uh you know it's like you sort of um you know when you sort of like suspend moving into adulthood or taking on any sort of responsibility whatsoever for long enough, things start to get weird. And that was maybe the very first sort of part of that is sort of trying to, but, um, uh, but, you know, as far as like those tours and stuff, like, I mean, I loved, like, I, I, I didn't, there were, I didn't love every aspect of being in like, say like dead low tide, but, um, but I loved, you know, like I really liked being in a band with Mike Kunkka and um, I really didn't, um, you know, I don't have bad memories of like those tours and stuff like that. But I would get, you know, like I would be someone who would like um, everything could basically be going fine. And I would be like on tour, like I would be like would be playing a show and I'd be like sulky sitting at the bar hunched over sulking or whatever you know for whatever reason i I don't fucking know you know or i don't know what the fuck else i thought i was going to be should have been doing with my time or whatever what was i mean it your recall of that makes me think that's not the case anymore also just talking with you yeah well now i don't have to i've i'm um you know uh, because I guess now it's a choice. It's more of a choice. It feels like more of a choice now, in a way. Like it's like, a, um, I don't like. I don't like. I mean, for one thing, I don't go on tour. You know, like we go, like Mercy Devils will go and um, play a couple shows. You know, and people are like, "Oh, how's the tour?" And I'm like, Ugh. "I left." the day and a half ago and I go home tomorrow. Like it's, you know, right. flew into but, Vegas. Yeah. I flew into Vegas. I'd have my own hotel room, you know, um, I can, uh, afford to eat three meals a day as much, you know, you eat as much as this food as I want to, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to like be like, you know, I don't have to beg for a, another drink ticket or whatever. You know what I mean? I don't have to right. apologize for not being able to tip. I can just like, I can chill, you know, I'd see my friends and, um, and, uh, you know, all the music, all the, you know, so then it can just be like, a um, like a, it just feels like it's like a healthier, um, uh, expression or whatever. And then also it's like, you come to a point where you're like, Oh, these people are here. To, these people like us. They're here to see us. They're there's, they want they they want to have fun and um, we should just do that. Also, we're, I mean, also we're just, we're, I mean, I know I'm sure people don't like when people say this because they're like puking on stage and falling down in your own vomit. 
as a certain cachet or whatever, but <laughs> we're as better at it. We're better at it. Even when we're not, even when we fuck, even when we're fucking up, we're better at it, you know? Right. And, um, uh, and we make better, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's more fun or whatever. Everyone's you know? been doing it for a lot longer now. And they don't have, and yeah. And you're like, not like, yeah, totally. And then you're like, I guess it's cause we want to. Right. You know what I mean? Like, What's as that? if like I'm having some sort of conflict, like it would be like, go fucking go home. You know what right. I mean? <laughs> like I have a job, you know, was like sense, I'm, was that sense immediate when you guys started playing again in 2006? No, not at all. No, no. You guys had some of this carrying no. some of the old baggage. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Uh, what part of getting old helped you guys get over the humps? Um, well, it's like, I'm just happy to see everyone. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just happy to like, um, like, uh, be able to sit down with people that, um, Like, you know, you spend enough time in the backs of vans and sitting on shitty couches with big dicks drawn on the wall with people. Um, you get to know them in ways that uh, are are real, you know, and it's like you don't have to fucking talk about it, but it's like uh, um, just nice to like be with people that know you. And they're, and they're, and they know you and everything is still is, is fine. You know, the, we can, you know, um, because when you look back at everything, um, one thing that is very consistent is that, um, it's funny, you know, a lot of funny shit happened. Like we were funny. We were funny people. We were weird, you know. We were weird kids. And then also when you see people grow up and they're just way ratter now, you know, we're better. We're better people. Like people, we were people who wanted to do better. We wanted to improve, you know, and we, and we've struggled and, um, and, uh, you know, we're all more generous than we used to be. And we're all more kind than we used to be. And we're all more appreciative than we used to be. And, um, no one, you get, uh, you get really broken of the illusion that you're the special element, you know, right. because I've made, I, cause I've made a lot more music without the murder sea devils than I did with the murder sea devils. And, um, frankly, uh, the stuff without the murder city devils, um, for the most part, no one gives a shit about, you know, and, um, that's fine. You know what I mean? Like, that's not like, uh, but you're like, oh, this is like, like kind of special or whatever. Like, this is neat. Like, this is like us, like this is these, this, this group of people can, um, produce something that is, um, special to other people. You know, right. and it might just be this weird little niche, but um, it's like, a, a, you know, it's cool, you know. Is it when you guys do get together and do shows, is it hard for you to just plug yourself back in and sort of channel that old energy and tell those stories that maybe feel far, you feel farther away from now? Um, well, if I tell those stories, you mean like, kind of like our set list and like yeah. the songs themselves. Um, I've learned to wherever I'm, I w I've learned to be say like, no, not that one. Like right. not that song. I don't, I can't, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. Um, and that's fine with everyone. And then usually, you know, a couple of years later, I'm like, let's do that song um 
there's and and I'm not the only one that has stuff um they don't want to do but fortunately I feel like we can always um uh put together a set list that has enough of the favorites to not just being like you know like you know I mean I've sort of gotten over the like uh, um I'm going to like, this is about me and right. I'm not going to, whatever. I mean, I, I, uh, mo the, fortunately most of the, I mean, when I'm standing on a stage and we're playing some of those songs and some of those words are coming out of my mouth, I'm, th there's fun in my brain. That's like, I wouldn't, wouldn't write that again. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I hope no one else is paying as much attention to these as I am right now. I hope I don't get fired for this. Up. But, you know, <laughs> what do you, but, you know, whatever. I mean, whatever. Like, you, you know, you play with Duff McKagan. <laughs> he's, he's. Must have some. <laughs> says, I mean, there's a lot of ridiculous. He's like the stuff. nicest guy in the world, and he's like, uh, I'm sure he. he in his, oh, uh, I mean, dark, when he turns the lights out and puts his head on the pillow at night, he's like, damn. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you have to imagine him at in 1993 on yeah. the verge of death. Yeah. I mean, we all have uh, like an element of that arc. Well, he made one lives. of the, he was part of making one of the greatest records in rock and roll, in the history of rock and roll. Inarguably, yeah. You know, so, you know, you gotta just roll that with it. That inspiration comes from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Well, also, you know, you think sometimes you think you're being, you know, you're not, you think you're like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, this isn't m me or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, that sense of responsibility isn't necessarily there in the, in the, in the moment when you're like, you have your pencil out and you're writing something in a notebook or whatever. I, I see a parallel between the murder city devils and early guns and roses in the, well, energy. we were, I, I mean, we I always to this thought shit. so. We loved guns and roses. We, everyone, we, we loved guns right. and roses. I remember when I told Derek that I was playing with him, he was like, no way. <laughs> He's like, I met him once. <laughs> Um, we played some, uh, I think maybe it was dead. I think it was, I, I can't remember. Maybe it was dead. Look, I think it was murder city devils played some shows with, uh, it was probably 10 minute warning and Duff oh, was yeah, fucking, I mean, I met Duff a few times and he's fucking nice. He's a fucking yeah, nice guy. Super nice guy. I'd see him. I, I lived in Ballard. I'd see, I'd be sitting at the bus stop and he'd walk by. You know? Right. Well, I think that. For both of those bands, they both, from the outside, looked like gangs, yeah, and felt like gangs, like a like a like a crew of people who had each other. Like you, yeah. you would you don't imagine them not together. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and then also, you know, the stories and the vibe. Um, you know. The, that appetite album was pretty dark. Yeah. And dangerous. It was really dark. It was like it was like if um it was like if you could see into it's like if you were in that same scene that Montley Crew was in, but you're not full of shit. Right. You know, you like like you don't you know, your best friend doesn't die in the passenger seat of your car and then you act like it didn't happen. Your best friend dies in the passenger seat of your car and you write a fucking dark ass song about it. Right. You know, it's like they were really, it was, it was insane what they did. 
It's insane. And it's insane that that's the scene that they came out of. Cause it's like, and that they mostly it's insane to me that no one from that band is dead. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's something, uh, I don't know. It's like, maybe there's something in having your struggle be more, um, out front that's in a way healthier than trying to project a, because they didn't really need to um, project too much of a false image of themselves. <laughs> Whereas right. other bands feel like have that sort of sense of responsibility to sort of project something that uh, maybe isn't, you know, the turmoil that's going on inside of them is, is, is more concealed or whatever. Um, right. And then also, you know, like when they're, if you have a certain level of success and then you have all these people that are invested um, and you've projected yourself a certain way, then you're sort of um, fucked or whatever, you know? Um, I mean, it's very, 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 very uh, sad to me, you know, how many people die, you know, how many people have, you know, um, you know, for reasons that I, I can't, I don't know exactly, but I do know that, um, uh, you know, it's a weird, it's a, not a healthy ego place or whatever, you know, to it's like have accepted this. as an occupational hazard for rock musicians. And I think that that is, I think that's too bad. I think it's really unfortunate because going into it, Many of us are romanticized by that danger and that darkness. Certainly. And it's also not exactly discouraged by the lifestyle. Like you. you well, know, I think also town. no one's, you can't say anything because it's like, I mean, I, I mean, there was definitely, you know, going back a long, long time ago, but like, say with Mercy Devils, it was like, no one could, t you couldn't like, you can't tell someone to stop drinking because right. who the fuck are you? You know, like, um, You're you can't, it was like the, the, the culture of, of enabling is like, and it's also like, well, that's why we're here. Right. Right. You know, like I'm here so that I can, you know, uh, you know, like get out of bed and there's a, um, the hotel sink is full of ice and beer from the right. night before, you know, because um, the cold beer was more valuable than the sink. Sure. <laughs> that makes perfectly good sense to me. Yeah. Actually. And you're like, it's like it can... Um, but, you know, say like with like a Guns N' Roses situation, like those are people that never had to pretend that shit was fine. You know what I mean? Like, right. um, I guess they could delude themselves that shit was fine, but they, from an outside perspective, wasn't like, you know. Um, no you one know, looked seemed, at them and thought, oh, those guys are, they're fine. Yeah. They're they going to live together. forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so maybe there's something about that struggle being having your struggle be something that's like um just a like not not a shameful secret it's just a, a right. shameful truth of your existence well, that, that's a more common thing now than it was 20 or 30 or in guns and roses years 35 years ago you know yeah. people didn't talk about that stuff and it's a I don't know if it's a symptom of the internet or, you know, the information age, people are much more um, out with their deficiencies or the struggles yeah. that they have, whether it be mental health or substance or whatever. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about M Krebs. I've been listening to yeah. the record and cool. Uh, it's great. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm particularly fond of, um, I think it's the fourth or the fifth song. Is it Calm the Beast? Uh-huh. Really nice instrumentation. It's uh, the, Also, the recording sounds great. Did you do yeah. this? We did it you at did... Kill Room in Georgetown. Um, and uh, uh, it was really, I mean, uh, me and Brian Yeager had been sending... He, it was like I knew, like sort of the one thing that I've kind of been looking for for a long time is that um, there's lots of people that I can I can collaborate with and um, feel like we can make really, you know, we can make cool music and stuff. But um, with Brian, it was like, I knew that he was going to, want to take it like do it like like let's not only do this but let's do this and let's go into a real studio um with a real engineer and let's um not just drop it as soon as it's done you know like let's keep carry the ball and um and and see where we can take it or whatever. So that's something that's, that's really great. And he's so skilled. And then, um, when Jeff put drum, when, you know, when Jeff came in with drums and just really hit the mark so well, um, it's really exciting. I mean, it's really neat. neat to me. When did you guys record during, during COVID time? I'm... Uh, it was like probably like six months ago or something. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. It wasn't long ago. Um, and we had a label that was gonna, we, we had someone that was going to put it out on vinyl. Um, uh, this kind of label slash, um, kind of zine makers called this and that tapes. Um, but then it, but it takes like, it takes like a year now to put out vinyl. So we we're sort of like, and then, and, and they weren't really sure if they could knew if they were still going to be wanting to like, just, you know, have a record label a year from now or whatever. <laughs> um, so we're sort of like, it kind of put the ball in our court more in a way that is ultimately, I think probably positive. Um, I mean, it's the first thing I've done in a, in a long, long time that's so accessible, just like, like physical, like it's on streaming services and stuff and you can hear it. And, um, um, and everyone, we took it, you know, seriously and we're working on more now. They, um, went back to, there's more music, um, on the way. And you guys, you guys worked the songs up, or like mailing, emailing yeah. back and forth files. We used this app called. Um, we use this like phone app, and would just like make real rough. Um, uh, Brian would just like send me something real rough and then I would record vocals like on my phone and send them back. And then, um, we just sort of decided kind of like which ones were worth pursuing. And then, um, we just went in the studio and just kicked it up many, many notches. Right. <laughs> Have you guys played a show? No, no, I, I think we'll see. I think we'll play, you know, I live here and they live in Seattle. Um, so if we, if it comes, we'll just see how it goes. Like if it seems like there's a, um, if people want us to, if people ask us to, people want us to, then we'll um, figure out how to do it. It's very diplomatic. I, I, I've never waited for anyone to want what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it would be a, a first for me also. 
uh, until long after I'm giving it to them, they're still yeah. like, no, nah, we never wanted it. Yeah. Thank you, though. Yeah. No, I mean, I've toured without a record. You know, like, Is toured right? with no, no one's heard of you. No, it's just, you know. Right. Just act like something's happening that's not. That's a tough one because um, it's hard to put that gas in the tank. Yeah. Yes. But I guess it used to be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> used to be a lot cheaper. Um, so th is this the first time you've collaborated on a record in this way? Um, no. Uh, my band Triumph of Lethargy would, me and my friend Corey, forever, for a wee before, I mean, we would literally send um, cassettes and shit, like CDs and cassettes back and forth. And then we made, did some mixing on our own and then would get, get together and finalize stuff. Um, but it's the first time where uh, the final product is like, a, you know, a studio record, you know, like a... Right. Um, but it's, uh, um, it's nice in the sense that, um, there's a, it's nice to have this sort of throwaway aspect of it, of like, what do you think of this? You are like, no, I'm like, all right, I'll just do, you know, like right. you can just make lots and there's not a, um, uh, um, and also, you know, that you only need a seed of it to, you know, you're like, right. You only need that little bit where you're like, okay, no, this will be rad. Like, so the app you guys were using, Spire. whatever you were it recording, Spire. it, it like, uh, it just joins in some cloud and you can both access the files. Yeah. Totally seamlessly. Just like, uh, um, wow. Really easy, really, um, uh, and there's like a free version and then there's the version you pay for. And I always just use the free version and it just, um, means that, uh, you know, you can't add anything inside of it or whatever, but, um, it also means you don't pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just there. It's just like so easy. Like you get the, um, it's with generally speaking was just like seamless in like you receive it in a text message and then you just send it this other thing in your phone and then um uh huh. it made it really really easy what uh, what a world we live in i know i know uh the first song's called john john prine who i'm a, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a big fan of john prine yeah yeah me um, too did you ever see him live no what a fucking treasure did you see him live? A couple times, yeah. Wow, yeah. I've um, watched footage of him live. Um, that's amazing. But no, I never saw him. What a charming guy. Yeah. Like a Seemed supreme like beautiful storyteller. Person. Oh, yeah. Beautiful person. And like what a um, nice, seemingly from the outside, what a nice way to have a music career. Seems like he just... Like he did what he wanted. Yeah, I've seen I I've, I've seen like him talking before. I think it was before probably the last record he made, and like his um, kids like run his record label, and they're like, you know, hey dad, you know, like I think it's time to make another record, and he's like, I just made a record, and they're like, oh, that was like ten years ago, and he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so he um <laughs> likes to write songs in like a hotel. So he got a hotel room and just go by himself and write a record, you know? One of my very earliest musical memories is just like listening over and over. Is that there was like a couple of seven inches that were just around in the in the house. One of them was Boy Named Sue. And uh -huh. the other one was Dear Abby. And I listened to those seven inches so much. You must uh, have had cool parents. Uh, I mean, 
you know, like I yeah yeah I hear you that. Um, <laughs> they had good good taste in music. Is that what they had good taste. <laughs> I mean, my my parents were fine. They were they were yeah. definitely out outliers. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Uh, but so what, how did you get inspired for these songs? Cause I imagine it wasn't like, uh, six months ago it here, the songs were automatically, it was over the course of months and months of collaborating and writing on this on Spire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, lyrically the delivery, the, the vocal, delivery was um happened in the studio you know like that was not i didn't know what my voice what the voice of it was going to be but the um the lyrics were way more came from more of a place probably of kind of abstraction than they ever have before for me uh, having having a narrative having one having thing having them make sense is is kind of it's or sound like they make sense is is important to me but what i what i realized when we were done is that um they came from a very dark place that i don't know what that place is exactly but um we i started writing I started doing the writing um, soon after I'd moved here and um, it was a uh, moving from Los Angeles to a rural community where, um, you know, it's like, um, it was just very for for the ego for my ego it was very um for a moment <laughs> it's a well, lack of i just don't i don't trust it anymore uh well it's worth not trusting isn't it <laughs> yeah i mean because uh, that is a uh, experience informing your opinion <laughs> shit uh, we were unceremoniously cut off, and we had to stop in the middle of talking about yeah. The, so the th- thematics. Let me. I'm gonna ref- refresh refresh my own memory here. So the record has. So there's a song called John Prine. There's a song called Peggy Lee. There's a song called Tim Harden, and um. The band is called M. Krebs, which is a reference to Maynard G. Krebs from The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, the television show from the 1950s. Right. Um, and when we were go, we were talking about John Prine, whom I love. I really hope that no one takes that reference as a disrespectful because it's not how it was intended. The man has an exceptional face, you know, <laughs> like he has a physicality about him that is um, different than the average, you know, um, person you see on a stage with under lights and cameras sure. and stuff. Um, uh, also, just the way there's this footage himself. of him. I don't know when it must have been, you know, when the first record came out, there's a, there's footage of him like on that you can find on YouTube on what looks like, you know, it must be a local television show, um, doing, um, Sam Stone 
and he looks like he looks like he's been up all night long and at some point in the course of that night someone beat the crap out of him and then um he he had some more beers and then went over to the studio and fucking just does this um beautiful beautiful uh what a performance tune. you know what a song um what a song jesus um but the you know like and then it's like you know peggy lee i was just sort of like so there's she has this song um um i don't i, I think it was a fucking huge hit i think it was called let's keep dance so let's keep dancing um it's this incredible song and it just like um you know i ended up kind of stealing a little piece of it so then i felt like i had to acknowledge you know sure where it came from so then all of a sudden she's in this song um tim harden is like uh this song was like making reference to these people i used to know and this sort of time in my life um uh, when I was hanging out with people who were a little bit older than me and just had this like really good taste in music and knew a lot of stuff that I didn't know. And um, he's just a songwriter that I really admire. And uh, um, and then his name just happened to pop up in this song that we made. Um, I think intentionally, I, and none of, none of those were intentional. Um, um, and then, then that character Maynard Krebs, just um, who is played by Bob Denver, who is also Gilligan, and yeah. um, his entire career, he had a long career, and he was always the same beatnik. Right. And it's really fascinating to me because um, he was this ridiculous stereotype, but then, um, you know, he came from that same time. He must have known some of those dudes. You know, there's no way Bob Denver went his whole life and, and never uh, crossed paths with Allen Ginsberg, and right. that must be a, that must have been a funny. You know what I mean? That must be, <laughs> and I can't imagine what it. You know, like all the people people um, in like, uh, you know, like creative pursuits are always and and everywhere in life. I mean, people oftentimes now you hear the term like a uh, like imposter syndrome or whatever like coming up like. Right. Well, how the fuck was that for Bob Denver? You know, that must have been kind of like a a weird a weird place to be, just uh, being the fake beatnik your whole life. But maybe he was a beatnik. Was he a fake? I don't know. Who, uh... I don't know. I also heard rumors when I was younger, before pre-internet or whatever. I had heard that um, the reason Gilligan had the war long sleeves is because he was a heroin addict. Really. Well, that's what I heard, but I've I've since sort of tried to figure out if that was true or not, and I and I have no idea. No evidence. No, he got busted for weed, but um, you know. What year do you know? Uh, like like probably like early sixties or mid sixties. I don't know. Him. He doesn't sound like not a beatnik. No, and the thing is with the weed thing is it seems like he was kind of taking a fall for the woman who played Marianne on um, Gilligan's Island. You need to tell this story. Well, it was like, it's just like from like a Wikipedia page or something. It's like um, either maybe she was delivering it to him and got caught and he, or, or vice versa. I can't remember. But he also defended her with the, um, with the studio that was doing the TV show because he, to make sure that she got paid as much as, um, the woman who played like the bombshell. That's uh, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he sounds like a pretty cool dude. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um. I mean, I don't. I don't even smoke. I don't do anything. I don't smoke weed. I don't yeah. drink. I'm a goody goody two shoes. Yeah, it's but good. 
That's good. Uh, but not because I've never. Right. <laughs> I just, I think that people who were smoking weed in the early, like before the hippies. Yeah. Um, I don't think enough can be said about those folks. Like, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not trying to like prop them up and make them out to be fucking heroes, but they were doing, they were doing something that was ridiculously outlawed. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, those laws came into place just to, um, punish jazz musicians for being black. Pretty much. I mean, those drugs were not, were made illegal to target specific members of the, of the population. Why do you think they you know? call them jazz cigarettes? Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, who is who is that 3M? Is that the corporation that there was alleged to be behind a lot of those laws as well? Oh yeah, I don't know that. I'm not. I don't. That, I'm not recalling that. that they were, history right now. They but, were producing yeah. synthetics that could be naturally oh. produced with the hemp plant. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then they called it marijuana because it sounded dangerous <laughs> and Mexican. Oh wow. There's all yeah. this. I mean. I don't know how much water these things hold, but, you know, there are all these sort of racially motivated things yeah. behind the criminalization of weed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which There's is... a lot of good um, drug uh, history information on the newest season of Cocaine and Rhinestones, that uh, podcast about country music that's extremely good. Uh, there's a bunch of drug info. Yeah, like just history of this kind of stuff um, right. that that uh, that that guy goes into. That's um, that's really interesting. How this will seem like a strange segue, but it's not that strange of a segue because you've moved to Hawaii, mm -hmm. and you are Caucasian mainlander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you. So you are an outsider. Yeah, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, did you have, did your wife have old, like, friends from her previous life there no. that you guys, no? No, when she left, when she left, she fled. Right. Basically. Um, and uh, it was, she had a really rough childhood year. And um, it was really, uh, um, it was the island. Yeah. It was the island that she loved. Um, but, uh, you know, the Hawaiian culture is, is really, is really cool. And, um, one thing that has helped me, um, here is that, um, sunscreen, I'm, my, my job is in like agriculture, you know, like basically or whatever. I'm a, I'm a beekeeper. So, um, you know, I can come people, I'm a working, you know, like I'm a working person, you know, so um, that uh, is is a little bit helpful. But um, no, it's the, the sort of, um, it's a very strange, it's a very difficult um, moral uh, conundrum literally like just like being here like it's it's a little because this is a colonized you know this is a colonized land that was um uh taken by the u.s government in a way that was very sleazy very overtly sleazy and um and uh and painful and um that uh history is not forgotten you know well and then hawaii is just continuously punished by the entitled uh, entitled and privileged tourist population. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very, very literally. I mean, just they're in a very like, um, like the infrastructure. I mean, like right. beyond just uh, uh, a very in a very like uh, physically, you know, How... as well as emotionally. I imagine that you steer clear of the downtown areas, the hotel districts, all that. 
kind of thing. Yeah, well, the Big Island, there isn't really such a thing. I mean, the Big Island, there's there's resorts. There's big resorts. Um, but there is, I mean, Kona is is a, is a city, basically. I mean, Kona is like a, um, you know, um, kind of like a, um, one of the larger towns in Montana or something like that, you know? Right. Um, and, uh, Hilo is, is like an old time kind of place or whatever. Um, where we are is like, um, cattle country basically. Um, so there's huge, there's a huge amount of, of tourism. There's a lot of tourism. And one of the problems is there is nowhere for the tourists to go. Besides, there's beautiful white sand beaches um, that are like adjacent to the hotels. Um, but because we live in this sort of like culture of um, kind of like uh, Instagram and this idea of like uh, um, quote unquote eco tourism, it just means people are driving their rental Jeeps around places they shouldn't be, you know? Right. And, and also a lot of people going places that they're not even interested in. Um, it's like one of the things that you notice when you live here is there's all these, like so many of the, of the tourists, they're not even enjoying the, they're not even seeing the beauty. They're traveling from like, one, it's very one photo strange. Op to the next. Yeah. And it's like, cause they can't stop, you know? And it's like, a um, it's very strange. It's very, very strange. It's like, and the thing that's also to me is like, just stay at the fucking resort and sit at the fucking beach and go swimming, right. you know, take a surfing lesson if you want or something, just eat your food at the fucking, just watch the sunset, you know, walk on the beach, just fucking just chill. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to be tearing around all over the place. Like, or as um, my like plate Sahir says, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like before I, I vacationed in, in Hawaii, you know, like I came here, I fell in love with it, you know, like, um, but, uh, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. It's like, um, what was the trickiest part of transitioning to being a resident there? Um, it's like, nothing tricky it's just like i mean nine o'clock at night it seriously it might as well be three o'clock in the morning right you know like uh the grocery store closes at seven um the uh restaurants that aren't open they're not open seven days a week but when they are open you know i mean when the sun goes down it's just like you better have everything you need to make dinner or whatever, right. you know? Um, but also there's this really, really wonderful culture of like, um, you know, like, at, like people are giving us, um, fruit and vegetables all the time. Um, things just grow like crazy. Um, so there's a lot of just like, um, not even, I wouldn't even call it like bartering. I would just say people just give you, avocado you know like please take this like it's gonna go bad mangoes and avocados and oranges and were you living there, there recent in the last couple of years there was like a huge there were two big scares one was like was it a fucking missile strike scare yeah it was that was before we got here but um yeah there okay. was a uh someone press the button or whatever i mean i would i'm inclined towards conspiratorial thinking on this actually but um yeah there was a alert a new that, that that um nuclear missiles were headed towards the island that's fucking insane and that i don't know if she was a congress person maybe tulsi gabbard had to like get on like um twitter or whatever and be like it's not real but yeah, people thought that there was going to going to be uh, eviscerated by um by nuclear weapons. And um it 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 um pissed pissed people off. 
Have you talked to But the, the people next about the it? same thing happened in Japan the next day. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. Isn't that weird? Well, Does that seem a little fishy? I mean, is it Cuz the official is... explanation is that this dude who worked for the, you know, civil defense or I don't know who he worked for just like press the wrong button that's bullshit <laughs> that sounds like a, a bull roar yeah it's uh that sounds like you know, uh, maybe a couple of systems got hacked to me yeah i mean it seems it seems un, it seems dubious but um and then you know there's like a you know i mean there's the volcanoes um and uh there's, you know, they do a tsunami warning test every month or whatever. Um, There's been but tsunami as far as that's, warnings as well. Yeah. Are you on high ground? I think we're high enough, yeah. Do you remember? It's, it, it, we're on high. It, it gets, the whole thing is a mountain. So right. you get to high ground pretty fast. Do you remember Scotty from um, Scotty Sound Guy Scotty? He Yes. He worked at Sit and Spin. Notoriously, I think he lived in the sound booth for years. <laughs> like, I th- like, I really, I think he lived there. Uh, he lives in Hawaii. Oh, yeah. There's a few people. Yeah, there's a few people that have drifted over here. Do you, do you see yourself being there for the duration? I think, um, yeah, I think probably, I think, uh, we weren't, that wasn't necessarily our intention when we moved, but now, um, uh, we have a daughter here living on the Island and that is probably going to be a little bit more of a pull. And, um, my wife's dad is here now and, um, you know, I don't know. It depends on how things go. I mean, that what that sort of idea was maybe um, just stay for for a while and then see um, see how it goes or whatever, and and then sort of explore where else we might want to be in the world. But um, at this point, I'm starting to feel like we'll probably be here for a long time. Right. There's part of me that thought like, well, maybe when we're old, it would be nice to be like in like a um, urban environment and just have like a little apartment where we can like walk to walk to everything, re- walk to everything. Yeah. Is it true that mainland products are exceedingly pricey there? Um, you know, I don't really pay very much attention to it. Like, I mean, before I was shopping largely at the um you know, uh, Whole Foods and, you know, Glendale or whatever, you know, it's like, <laughs> that, I mean, you know, it's like, I guess it's expensive. I don't know. Right. You know, it's, it's like, uh, and also it's just me and my wife. So it's like, we don't really need that much. Um, and, uh, we try to avoid as much as possible any mainland, like, um, kind of like fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. And, um, we eat a lot of like, um, a lot of fish that's local. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think that if you want to live a normal American lifestyle, this is probably an extremely expensive place to do that. Right. But, um, if you want to carve out, a little niche for yourself. Um, you know, I guess, you know, when things are expensive, one thing you can ask yourself is, do I need this? You know, that's a like, great we, there's really good, like there's local bread. There's a, you know, like there's a good bakery. Um, there's extremely good fish. There's, um, fruits and vegetables. Um, f- well, fucking, a, 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 a piece of food could fall out of a tree and fucking kill you. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's like, a, uh, there's fucking abundance or whatever. That's the Spencer other thing Moody? that, um, <laughs> killed, killed by a coconut. 
yeah that's the other thing that like people like the tourists they don't they just don't i think they just are incapable of 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 seeing which is fine you know um i don't know i mean probably the more destructive thing than tourism actually to the economy in general of of making it impossible to live here is people just like having homes that they don't even live in and also the airbnb stuff you know where it just gobbles up all of this um places for people to live for for nothing for no reason except for um someone's you know profit for someone's profit i feel like i would you know i understand I feel like I would be an asshole if I didn't back up 10 minutes and ask you, how did you get into beekeeping? Is that something that you oh, had done just, before or no, you got to no, the I island just, and you were It was like, a answer to add in Craigslist. Wow. And just started out like being like putting the honey into jars and putting the jars on pallets and then um every opportunity i had to go out with the beekeeper i i did and then um you know that was like a little over two years ago um and uh now i'm just in the field all the time taking care of the bees um which is uh really cool you know it's really neat it's really hard it's really hard work they recognize you is that true no 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 Um, have you tell me, will you tell me, like, elaborate a little bit on like what that gig is like? It's, it's really Um, interesting to me. It's, uh, well, I feel like it's like farming. My boss is like, no, it's like, it's animal husbandry. It's, um, you know, you just got to keep them alive. You know, you just gotta, um, there's a, it's organic, we're, we're organic, we, we're all organic, which makes it a lot more difficult, um, be a lot easier if you use pesticides. Um, so there's a couple of creatures that, um, there's hive moths and there's hive beetles that, um, can decimate your population and, um, really, um, you know, bees are really cool and they're and they can be really gentle and really nice to work with and they can also kill you they can get really mean sure and um you got your suit you know you got your gloves you got your bee suit you got all of your protective stuff but um when they get angry they're gonna find a way to get you and um it can be really intense it can it's a really intense environment it's really um because you're surrounded by these, there's like, you know, the sound is crazy, like everything and, and, and then handling the Queens and, um, just getting in there, you're in the, you know, you're down in the, in the hives, um, in these, in these boxes of, um, and there's millions, I mean, there's fucking millions of them, you know? And, um, it's, uh, you've been in, it's, in a it's, situation it's intense. Like- it's, You've been in a situation where they've been angry and. Oh like a... yeah. Yeah. And they'll get in your, like if you, f- you forget to zip up your veil Oof. and then bees come into the veil and you, your instinct is to get the veil off, but there's a lot more bees outside of the veil than there are on the inside of it. So then you just got to take your dirty licks and it's, um, you know, uh, it's, a uh, um, it's fucked up. It's, it's, it's insane. <laughs> and also you can develop an allergy really fast. Um, right? you can go from being totally, totally fine with the bee stings to they'll just, they'll kill you. You even have to be careful about your clothes. Like, uh, um, like the, the clothes that you wear in the field when you're working with the bees, um, that they get, they can become, um, they can trigger, in a, they can trigger like dangerous allergies in other people. Um, really? There's all kinds of weird. There's all kinds of weird stuff, and it's. Um, but you know, also what it comes down to is it's a lot of just like heavy lifting, and like right. moving around heavy stuff, and we're driving big um, flatbed trucks and have to 
make sure everything's strapped down properly and then you have to have, and you have to make sure all your your equipment is you know the trucks and the forklifts and everything are all um uh in in working order and um it's like it just rural rural economy stuff embarrassingly i only learned last year that ingesting lo- like honey that is local to where you live is medicinally helpful to you because is that it's very dubious is that right it's very that's a very dubious um there's a lot of honey is healthy sure. and there's and there's and it's antiseptic and um there's some honeys that are like i mean there's honey that they use there's there's honey that like the military buys um for amputees to to rub on their on their stumps and stuff like um really honey is really good for you and it's really great the allergy stuff is um that might be true if if the plant if the flower that the bee is foraging on is exactly what you're allergic to right you like know it seems and like it um, makes sense it, it does seem like it makes sense. What I would say is that um, honey is good for you, yeah. and that um, there is no harm in. Uh, but that, uh, like, really, those bees would need to. That honey would need to be from like in exactly where exactly where you're from. Like not even like, like from you your know, yard. not ten <laughs> miles away. Like right there, kind right. of. But. Um, and then also the forages, generally speaking, they're going to be foraging on all kinds of different stuff and it's going to be changing throughout the year. So, um, you know, but, uh, um, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have medicinal value. What an interesting turn I feel like we've taken. I love this. Yeah. Uh, you, I feel like you've, <laughs> you've had, a, I mean, from what I, from what I know, a few interesting gigs that you've taken on. And yeah. Would you say well, you that's dove something into about this? living this kind of life. I'm sure you have too. Yeah, you bet. You know, I mean, that's something that's funny that people don't talk about very much is that like, I've been a, I've, I've, I'm 46 years old, and about 10 minutes of my life I was I a professional musician. Right. You know what I mean? And when I say 10 minutes, I mean that like almost literally like, you know, like day, there were some days where I thought that, but you know, I've always had to work. I've always had to. And, and since you sort of prioritizing these other things, I mean, like any artist, um, you know, you just have to, um, you still got to pay your rent, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, I've done all kinds of stuff and it's, and it's cool. It's neat. Uh, what a, I mean, it's not the most secure life in the world to be a musician. No. When you dedicate yourself to a life of having music in it. Um, yeah. But I, I wouldn't have it any other way. No, I was always what I from the on from the beginning I thought of it as uh, somewhat detrimentally to myself in the sense that. Um, this might not have been the best mind frame to go go into things with, but I always considered it like basically like an oath of poverty, and that if there was ever money, that that would have been that that's the that I that I I realized that that's a freakish event, not a given. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like I know people that are so much more successful than me, and they don't have shit. You know, it's right. They also. <laughs> You know, I don't know. They're not keeping bees. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, believe me, you know, I would fucking quit tomorrow. You know? But I still value it. You know yeah, what I mean? Course. But it's still cool. And I also think this is a very arrogant thing that I'm going to say. But um, You're in a safe space. I think there's a value in having the art makers be people that are in the same situation that everyone else is in. You know what I mean? Like, I love, I love Bruce Springsteen. I fucking love Bruce Springsteen. That motherfucker never had a job in his life. Right. 
you know, and he made his, he made, he's made, uh, probably, probably at this point, he might be a billionaire. He's a fucking, he has hundreds of millions of dollars. And, um, that is predicated on songs about being a working person, which he is not, right. you know, not that he's not a, I'm sure he's a workaholic. I'm sure. He's works plenty, you know, and I'm, and I don't want to fucking go on stage for four hours. Um, but, uh, I think it's good to have, have folks that are, that, you know, are, are from the position of, of, you know, just regular struggle or whatever. I think so too. But I would give it up. <laughs> I would give up the struggle. <laughs> here, here. Here, here. Um well uh listen. I've had uh I've had a great time talking with you. Uh Thank you, is Mike. there is there a website for M Krebs? Uh there's a there's a Instagram where you could keep up on what we're doing. Bandcamp? And there's the um uh there is Bandcamp. Oh good. And we're on all of the streaming services, I think. And there is a um and we're probably gonna have stuff for sale on the this and that tapes website. Great. Um and they're probably gonna have, do some form of physical release of stuff, like a maybe a seven inch um maybe a full length at some point and then we're doing like a um a zine like lyric sheet that'll come with the download code and stuff like that awesome so the m krebs should be easy to find and um from my perspective um just i don't care how you listen to it i w i want people to hear it and i don't i don't care how um and it's on spotify and apple and all that shit Awesome. Anything coming up for Murder City Devils? Any plans for the future? Uh, we got a show in Atlantic City in September, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a festival. You might see me there. Oh, cool. It's not far, really. Cool. In the yeah. scope of things. I've never been. I've never been to Atlantic City before, so I'm kind of stoked. I've never been there either. I hear it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I was just uh, I was just in Philadelphia for work. Uh huh. And my coworker bought a house in Atlantic City, uh -huh. a block from the beach, for a hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and yeah, that piqued my interest. Yeah. Yeah. On that trip to Philly, also, on an uh, going under an overpass. Um, I saw a spray painted image of just a big, misshapen, uh, erect penis that looked like it was done by someone who had never actually seen a penis. It was just like <laughs> someone described what a penis looked like, and they were like, "Okay, yeah. I think I can do that." And yeah. uh, that's that's what I thought of when you were explaining um, green rooms earlier. And uh, yeah. I, when we drove past that, I laughed for about five minutes because uh, that's the other thing about um, this life. <laughs> yeah. A drawing of a dick yeah. on a wall is always funny. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always within reach. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one, no matter how nice the place is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll I'll look I'll look for the date and I'll I'll plug both of those things at the top. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much. I'm going to kill this. <laughs>